Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host. I've got co-hosts here with me today. We're going to have an, a fantastic show, and this will probably be the last show that we will do on this whole business of uh, uh, just just focusing on on someone that's not elected to president. How about that? I mean, that's what we that's what we are today. It's, it's Donald Trump, and it's the guy's either he's either president today, right now, today. He hasn't been inaugurated yet, or he's elected. Okay, we've gone through that process, but until he goes through that swearing-in ceremony, he only he gets both of the hits at the same time. Hmm. He's elected, and he's president. So what we're going to do, we're going to do that, and then we're just going to get back to his brand that he was talking about, and that was, let's make America great again. That's where we should be. And from a local perspective, let's make Oregon great again. And then from a more personal, personal branding aspect of it, let's make Portland, the city of roses, i.e. great again. That's where we're going to be. So we're going to spend the day talking about the, the, this person that um, that supposedly uh, who, he, well, he was elected through that process aspect of it, through the general election aspect of it. But uh, we're going to be, probably be closed for about, well, the month of January and whatever. Uh, yeah, month of January. When we come back in February, we'll have a, we'll have a president-elect. And then we'll, we'll go through i.e. deal. And I'm sure that the media is going to definitely stay on, on, on tune on that piece of Okay, so there you got that format, and then so that's what we're going to do today. We got we got Jim Lewenberg right here with us, and we got Scott. There's the man. He represents the state legislature down up in Salem. As you know, a lot of us don't read the newspapers and stuff like that. So we got Scott here that's going to share some thoughts about what's going on in the legislature. Big thing down there right now is the budget. That's going to be huge. And then we got Jim. Jim is not besides being an attorney. He's a he's in the courthouse every day, day in day out. You know, defending and doing whatever he has to do. And and uh, we, we're fortunate to have him here also too. As you know, his background. He's I think he's running. You've he, he ran for longer than I have, right? No, we 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 were uh, you were running for Senate and I was running for Oregon Supreme Court right, judge. Right. That was that's how we met years right, ago. Right. Right. But you bet you you had a more uh, you had a more specific effort. You made a more specific. You know what I'm talking about. You were the only legitimate candidate that I've known to to this date, who paid his filing fee with uh, gold coin or silver he, coin. With gold, it was silver coin. He yes. he paid his filing fee in, in silver coin. Got that? <laughs> what what if we, we were to ask that for today? What do you think? Well, first the silver would have gone up, <laughs> right? Well, I I don't know for sure, but my suspicion is that that money didn't go into the coffers of the treasury. I'm sure that uh, employees at, at the Secretary of State's office. You know, uh, oh, out. Jim, really? If, if I were working there, that's what I would have done. Oh, my God. We better check it out. Who's, who, this is Secretary of State's office? Well, this is years and years ago. But, yeah, but still, who but was there? Who was there? I, I, I want to know who was there. Was Kate there? I don't remember, okay. frankly. It was well, it's well back. But anyway, uh, fortunately, it was, it was when I was running for the, the, the lowest filing fee of all. It was for a circuit court judge of $50. But it cost me $650 in uh, Federal in Reserve notes in order to get uh, $50 worth of silver coin face amount. Wow. Awesome. 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 Well, hey, that's a little side note that just shows you. Give me a little background on Jim here. He gets very much involved in the deal. But what we're going to do, like I said, we're going to break it up. And we got we got a 30-minute segment on the first part. We're, like, we're going to talk about uh, Trump, the businessman, the businessman, well, the businessman. Yeah, and you know, there, you talked about Oregon impact. Right. Uh, if you dig deep in today's Oregon, you see that there's a really negative impact on a very important Oregon business, Nike. Yes. Yes, because they're looking at having a they're looking at reducing the corporate tax rate, you know, across the board from 35 to 20 or 15. But they're looking at having a new deal to make it so they can't deduct a lot of expenses that they have incur overseas. Yes. Which would be a huge hit to our local uh, giant, you know, company, uh, uh, Nike. And Don is looking at doing that. Uh, I, yes, he that's is. where he's at. And he's telling all of his buddies. All the folks that are listed as billionaires, look, we want you to help make America great again. Right. Bottom line, that's what it was all about. So all of us are going to have to basically work at it. Right? Fair? All of us. All of us from the person who's working on the job to the people who own the businesses. Bottom line. So let's talk about that. If I, I would say that uh, I looked at Chris Wallace today, you know, on, on Fox News, Fox Radio, the, and uh, he did an excellent job today. It was a beautiful job today. He had the opportunity to interview 
uh, I, the, the businessman Donald Trump for 30 minutes mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. and it was a very it was a very enlightening piece. And and some of the points that he were bringing things out, for instance, that uh, Donald's position in, in regards to uh, one the, as far as the taxes are concerned about his business and the other, he said, "Hey, I'm just following the rules." Now, if they want to change the rules, we can change the rules. Right. But I'm following the rules. Yeah, it's interesting because well, for, for uh, most federal employees, uh, there are all sorts of conflict of interest provisions prohibiting them from engaging in outside business activities. Mm -hmm. But one job doesn't have any of those restrictions, and that's U.S. president. Mm -hmm. So uh, technically, a as things stand right now, he, he could continue to operate his businesses and be president if he had enough strength and time. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, he's, he's talking about giving up most of his business activities, turning them over to his children. Right. But the one that you're talking about today mm -hmm. was him holding on to the uh, uh, Celebrity Apprentice right. executive uh, producer. Right, right, right. But he made the point. He said, hey, look. So, so basically what he did, he threw it on the table and said, okay, fine. Did I break the rules? <laughs> he no. says, no, I didn't break the rules. Right. But if you want to, now he didn't make that point about, well, if you want to change it. He didn't go through that. He, he just threw it out on the table and said, okay, go do your research. Well, he did that when he was a can when he was a candidate too. He said, "Yes, I use the bankruptcy laws for right. my, my businesses, yeah. but I, I I knew what the rules were, and I and I used them for my benefit or my company's benefit." Well, but it it was not an issue until all of a sudden now he's the apparent elected, he's the apparent president. Right. That's really now it's an issue. They could have done that a long time ago, right? But it just goes to show you also too. Once you become gets in that particular position, then you get totally examined. Oh. <laughs> Anybody, Absolutely. anybody, right? For whatever reason, I mean, Hillary would have been—it would have been done the same thing with Hillary because then Fox would have done the piece. No, the no, 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 no. Barack you know Obama said? got a pass for eight years. He really got a pass on all sorts of things. Not, not—he wasn't a but businessman. Now, 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 he's not president-elect now. We're talking about the ones that we're talking about the future. Uh huh. Yeah. He's done his eight years. We've we've used the name Barack Obama for eight years. Right. We don't need them anymore. We talked about race for eight well, years. Well, he's not done cr creating mischief, so you know. And, well, well, gee, Jim, give him a break, Jim. I mean, the guy's trying to get his get, get his own. What, what, what do you call the legacy and that kind of? What do you call that deal? Well, his his legacy is more Republicans in office yeah, since yeah, any but, point uh, since nineteen twenty eight. The man spent eight years. You know what I mean? You know, when he started out, no one wanted him to. They weren't going to do anything for him anyway. I mean, well, they on. didn't have to because McCall. his party was completely in charge yeah, but, of the but House. But my point Senate. is that when someone see, because I, I still feel that that most of the most of the folks who were concerned in the so-called in that segment of our society, the folks who were in that that aspect of it, were kind of thinking, well, gee, I don't understand this business about race stuff, and I'm I'm not right into this assimilation stuff. So the only thing I can say about it is, that, well, he's black. Let's talk about race, which is good, because we did. We threw it out on the table, and all kinds of things came out. We. We've had uh, LBGT came out of the deal. Everybody's using the civil rights name during that particular time. And then that, became, that, that was part and parcel of who he was. But one of the big differences between Donald Trump and, and Barack Obama is the way they've reacted to the families of law enforcement officers who've been shot. And, and even, though for, uh, even though Donald Trump doesn't have any official position, there have been several police officers uh, murdered uh, since he was elected or since the, since the election. And he has reached out and talked to the families of, of the police officers rather than the, the uh, people that, that the police officers shot. Uh, whereas Barack Obama made a, made a, a practice of, of uh, you know, helping the people that, that he thought the police officers had hurt rather than the p police officers themselves who had been hurt. Give me, a, give me a specific incident. Well, the, the first and most uh, infamous was the, that uh, Harvard law, prof or law, prof or, excuse me, law or, excuse me, professor that, that resulted in the, the uh, uh, beer summit. Well, he, he, had, he, had a, some, some, he had a deal with the guy who, who arrested him, right? Well, yeah. Who, the who, cop was white. But, but, yeah, but he was... At the White House. I mean, I would, if I was president, I wouldn't be sitting there talking to a cop that drinking a beer or something. I'd be dealing with the major issue across the board. I agree with it. But he did that. And that professor was a one... He was a he was a known figure. Mm -hmm. The guy was just going up to his own house. Yeah, but the but the law enforcement officer did absolutely nothing wrong, and he had a history of being, uh, you know, essentially colorblind. He 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 had absolutely no history whatsoever of, of racial animus and. Uh, 
Uh, and that was just the, the first of many examples of police officers, you know, being singled out. In fact, the, the thing that made that so uh, famous was that that Brock st started off by saying he didn't know about the facts of the case, but you know, okay. the cops had better, you know, okay. look out. Okay. Okay. And, and there's been a war on police officers. And it's been an undeclared war, but but they're being shot and killed uh, at a frightening frequency these days. In all colors. Yes, and I don't know only right. just white guys. I mean, black guys too. Okay. Yeah, that's and right. Now, even even in, in some of those shootings, if you will, in the black community, so to speak, I think the the, the, the one case in Carolina, I think it was something about the mm. there was a there was a black cop, undercover cop, that actually shot this this one particular guy, which is still under contention. You know, what I mean, it was it was right there on 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 TV across the board. Right. I'm still I still had a little concern about that from the standpoint that I, you could hear his wife in the background. Saying stop, honey, stop, honey, and these guys had to have heard what he had to say, and had, had I, in all due respect, it was just me. What I saw, what I was saying, well, gee, was someone to say, hey, come on, this, you, are you, you know this guy, this, this your husband? Look, say something to him. If he, if you can get his attention, let's get this thing out. We don't want to shoot anybody. Right. But that didn't happen. You know what I mean? But my point is that you're right. It, it, it is an issue. Law enforcement is an issue, uh, and Donald got very much involved uh, with police during the election process. Mm -hmm. In all due respect, again, a good businessman. That was part of the platform. Nobody had resolution. It was it was high profile stuff. Why not identify? Well, in, had it been Boy Scouts or something like that, or Cub Scout, he would have been over there. At the end of the day, people want law and order, and beyond that, they demand law and order. Yeah. And that's why, in the aftermath of the election, especially here in Portland, where you had a million dollars worth of damage being done to businesses downtown, the mayor said nothing, did nothing. The governor said nothing, did nothing. The only leadership we saw was from Bill Currier, chairman of the Oregon Republican Party, who was out. He made a statement. He was demanding that Mayor Hales resign. Yep, said, Look. Yep, yep. And, you know, I'd like to remind folks, this is the importance of law and order. I wasn't around for the 60s, right? I was, I was born in 1980, but I read up on my history. You saw those protests in the 60s become increasingly violent over time. What did you get out of that? Richard Nixon reelected in a landslide in 1972 yeah. as the law and order candidate. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can see history will very well repeat itself. You know, I'm going to throw this out well, the other thing, But the other thing, we talk about law enforcement. Well, I brought up law enforcement. Yeah, yeah. But the other thing that has, has marked the beginning of the, the Trump administration right, is appointing or seeking to appoint generals, retired generals, yeah. to various yeah. Depart Department of Defense and, and uh, Homeland Security. Um, and, and I think there's a real reception, a warm reception to that, because I think that uh, uh, with the Democrats, there have been a, a tremendous a a anger and antipathy against military people. A and now, what's one of the things about making America great again is to honor our military. And I think that's one of the things that, that uh, Donald Trump is doing, is he's honoring these, these fine men uh, and, and offering them or trying try to get them uh, in civil, civilian positions of uh, high, high positions in, in his, his administration. It was brought out, by the way, in that interview with, with Chris Wallace, uh, that um, uh, he had sort of a, a, an advantage uh, over Clinton, Hillary, in when they were running in regards to the military. He went to military school. Mm. So he had some background, if you will. He was very okay. familiar with uh, with the military folks. In most cases, these, these academies, there's always a general there or so you know some high officer up in that particular area. So he, he had that background, so to speak. That that helped him out. We also has a history of actually helping troops. Uh, there are several examples of, of charitable yeah, work he's done on. with the troops long before he was thinking about becoming president. So this wasn't just something he he did in the last year to, for publicity. He was doing this uh, throughout his career. Um, and the other thing is with with uh, uh, Ms. Clinton is she hates the military. I mean, and her husband does too. And and, and that was so obvious. They hate law enforcement. Well, they well, hate the Bill, military. Bill never served. He, he never served in the military. He, you know, he, he wasn't a. Well, one of the most famous quotes from him is, uh, you know, I hate or we hate the military. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, and, and early on you think about this other thing. I mean, I'd made a point. We talked about this a bit about the fact that the Republican Party could have had uh, the first African American. Uh, president, if you will, with the R, and that was Colin Powell. But there were some issues in regards to some I of I think it's largely the fact that Colin Powell's wife doesn't want him to run. No, I and mean, I've it, seen it, that direct it, quote. It, it would be on it's it. Her so, saying, if you run, uh, I'm out of here. In all, in all due respect, he was one of the smartest guys in the administration during that time because he he'd actually fielded certain jobs, all the, all the jobs. Oh, yeah. And he did what he was told. He was military. But if your wife doesn't want you to run, you don't run. Yeah, but that you was the, keep your wife. But the other side of the coin yeah, is she didn't in, want him to get shot. And either. don't forget, he's endorsed the last three uh, Democrat presidential candidates. Yeah, the R's didn't want him. You know, I mean, I you know, look at me. I'm sitting up here now. I got the R. 
sorry. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Republican. I'm a Libertarian, and I'm, I got the Lincoln shingle too. <laughs> yeah, but Colin Powell was the first African American Secretary of State. And, yeah. And, you know, George Bush yes. uh, picked yes. him to be his Secretary yes. of State. And you know, he he made a statement for the United Nations. You know what I mean? That. The, uh, either the president said, this is it, it, and he, he did the deal, and then he got the hit for it. Well, and then you've got Condoleezza right? Rice. I was you reading got... that Condoleezza Rice has right. been among those that Trump has met with. Uh, I think she's one of the few Bush administration officials who actually, by the end of that administration, still looked good Yes. in the public's eyes. So I think that if they do bring Condoleezza Rice on, that it would be a huge credit to Tough the deal in a man's world. I mean, I'd be right up front with you. That's one of them. I mean, She'd rather be NFL commissioner. Yeah, yeah, I'd but, probably but like to see that, is, too. It was, it was the woman's time. That's the way it was pretty well laid out from the standpoint it was going to be a one it was the woman's year if you will to be a president aspect of it but Congolese rice no there's no comparison between her and, and and colon you know it's military type stuff i mean that's why i brought up the idea of of colon aspect yeah of but it. in terms of intellectual powerhouse she she's one of the smartest women smartest people that's ever served in the u.s government yeah I mean, you, know, you don't get to be president of stanford unless you're uh, really you know yes, but, but, if you can't, but if you can't get into the ghetto and you don't get in those foxholes do you that's another area. That's the issue that we're dealing with right now today. Right. I mean, we're talking about law enforcement, things of that nature. Yes. You think about military. I mean, it's a lot of sense aspect. I appreciate what you But one saying. of the other things I think has been fun uh, to look at how Trump, Trump approaches the people he's looking to hire is right. he's he's looking to hire successful people, people, oh, yes. you know, multimillionaires. That was brought out there. Big yeah. Time. Big and, time. and, you know, I, I got it. I, I had, even I'm not a multimillionaire. I'm not even a millionaire. But. I, I ad admire the fact this man is not the least bit embarrassed about being wealthy. Yeah, and, yeah. and one of the things that he measures success is how, how successful are you financially. And so it makes sense for him to, to choose people who have demonstrated tremendous success yeah. financially. Which would explain why he hasn't called me. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that, by the way, that came out in that interview also, too. I keep right. going through it. I was really excited about the way Chris did that piece because he was just laying it out. He's a businessman. And then you start thinking about the media when he was coming up through the ranks, if you will, in the primary, in the primary aspect of it. All of the media, they didn't have that business background. No. There was no business person interviewing another business person. No. And they were frustrated about it because this guy is just coming just strictly looking at the bottom line. I mean, I'm following the rules. That's it. And then so they, they, so they then said, well, what the heck with him? We're just going to focus over here on these, i.e., folks that we are more familiar with, all right. the other candidates. And then all of a sudden, boom, he wins. So what do I do now? I can't interview. What do I talk about? Read Fair? a business textbook. Uh, what's obvious through the cabinet picks that he's made so far is the fact that Donald Trump, as our president-elect, is going to do things differently. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure that that was what he campaigned on, and that's what people were expecting, especially when it comes to agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, people act shocked that he's not going to have an environmental lawyer or a former Greenpeace. You know? Well, I tell you, we have been progressing towards a, a, an agenda that's going to be horribly damaging to our economy. The idea that, that man-made uh, uh, climate change is at, at fault for you know, raising temperatures. Well, uh, I think the, the con, you know, they keep talking about the consensus, scientific consensus. Well, I understand the con scientific consensus is, in fact, we had a guy on this show who mm -hmm. was running for office and, and was a real uh, scientist, and he said uh, there, there may be a uh, rise in temperature, but there's no demonstration that's caused by yeah. man. And also, there's no, there's no way to know what man could do to, to reduce it mm -hmm. without destroying mm -hmm. you know, our economies. Mm -hmm. and, and destroying our economies is what I think the Obama administration and what the, the Clinton administration had been elected would have been aiming for. And that's what I was going to throw on the table. If all of a sudden it was just the opposite, and all of a sudden she was the apparent elected person, if you were the president, how do you think we would react? How, how do you think the media would react? Then it would be just the opposite. And Fox would be over here. CNN would be over here. Right. And they would be taking the attack mode. They'd be taking the idea, uh, i.e., the, uh, the the positive mode for Clinton aspect of it. Well, there's a lot of good stuff that's going to happen, or different things. For, for instance, in terms of economy, you know, the, the, the uh, Obama administration had on its table, first under Clinton and then under Kerry, the idea that the pipeline going from Canada down yeah, to, the, that, to, the, yeah. to New Orleans. And and, and there, the science was it was it was safe. There was it was, but it just kept getting postponed and postponed and postponed, which angers the heck out of the Canadians. Right. They have, want to have a, a, a profitable market, and the best way to do that is to take the oil and natural gas down to our southern port. But the alternative, it, you know, it's not going to go wasted. They could they could build a pipeline to the, their their west coast. 
Uh, anyway, I think that with the Trump administration, the chances of that pipeline being uh, completed in the near future within the, his four-year administration are very, very good, which would be a great thing for Canada mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. our economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to me, that was one of the first things about Trump when he was running uh, that helped win me over to him. He wasn't my first choice, my yeah. second choice, my yeah. third choice, anything of the sort, right? But when he released his energy policy, I got to look at that and in a nutshell, it says we're going to do the opposite of what we've done the last eight years. And once it got into the specifics, I said, that's good enough for me. Mm -hmm. Bear in mind, I've been working in the legislature where we saw those kinds of energy policies under the Obama administration be exploited. We're still mm -hmm. trying to figure out what happened with business energy tax credits mm -hmm. and all these other mm -hmm. schemes that cost Oregonians uh, billions of dollars. And we still get from the Department of Energy that the total electrical generation in Oregon that comes from solar mm -hmm. after all this money spent mm -hmm. is less than a fraction of a percent. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. joke that I make, and this is hyperbole, but mm -hmm. you could have taken that same amount of money out in dollar bill form, set it on fire and created just as much energy. Yeah. 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 You make a good, you make a good point because again, getting back to old, the Donald, Donald Trump aspect of being the business person that he is and the successful person as a result of it, he had to be, he, he, his whole point was, I stick by the rules. I didn't like about. I didn't like these whole idea of regulations and this, that, and the other. But I, I dealt with it. But even more important than that is, I think his view is that we, the American people, are not the enemies of the American people. That American businesses are not the enemies of the American employees. He makes that point. He made that point. And so when American businesses succeed, they're going to be able to employ more people. They're going to, you know, everybody wins if we stop shooting each other. And that's what a civil war is, 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 you know, people from the same group shooting each other because you know, one group wants to control the other. And, and if we can stop that, which we've been doing for a, far too long, mm -hmm. and it's not just Barack Obama, you know, it, it predates him. But if we can stop shooting each other and, and work together, uh, we're going to do really, really well. Well, that's good. Like I said, I, I feel very strong. Again, I go back to the Obama thing. We've used... President Obama, because he is the president. He's not just Obama. Mm -hmm. He's president today. Donald is Donald Trump, but we've always kind of like misused him for quite some time. We've not, we've never recognized him for being a legitimate president. Trust me, in our society. But, but my point is that we had the opportunity to discuss it. I'm fine with that. Now, we're not going to be able to use the negatives on the Obama thing. We're going to have to. It's all going to be directed to Donald Trump who's going to be president-elect. And I like the idea we're going into a businessman kind of environment because he's going to be a no-nonsense kind of a guy, which is good. Had it been Hillary been elected president of the United States, then it's just carrying the baton, yeah. got me? Yes. And we'd be right back where we started from to begin with. And sure, we need to go through the situation. Hopefully we'll get some woman who's highly respectable and eligible and whatever and get her elected. We do need that because that, that helps, if you will, the assimilation of our races because that's been one of the major problems we've been having in our country. But the bottom line is that, you know, and I really want people, I really want to get that point across. We don't have to worry about talking about race now because Obama was part of the fuel piece to, to make it in a volatile aspect of it. But now it's on the table. We're discussing it. Now we got the immigration issue, you know, the illegal immigration, Mexicans and this, all this, that, and the other. Hey, now we've done that part. Let's get down to business. We're going to have Trump's going to be there talking about business, talking about the bottom line feeding families, addressing some of these major issues we're dealing with, the trade aspect of it. He made the point about, oh, no, we want to trade. I'm not going to cut trade, but I'm not going to let China do what he's doing. I mean, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, if a person wants to leave here and go to Mexico or whatever, but guess what? When you come back, you can't sell these goods. I was going to say, as far as consumers go, fine. Uh, you know, we have that market. Yes. And these countries are going to have to abide by some terms yes. on our end if yes. they want access to our markets. Yes. And at the end of the day, if the trade agreements that have been worked out yes. to date do not favor American workers and put them at a competitive disadvantage yes. and create incentives for yes. businesses to go overseas, then well, that's exactly what's going to happen. No, and that's what's all right, now happening. Here, all right, here, Talk to me. Now, okay, you know, Apple computers, you know, that, you know, the brainchild of Silicon Valley. Right. Um, there are very, very few Apple products that are manufactured in the United States. And the story that I've heard, and I, I'm not an expert, but, but the story I've heard is the problem isn't employee costs, the problem isn't uh, um, you know, tax rates, the, the problem is rules and regulations that prohibit a, a mm -hmm. factory in the United mm -hmm. States mm -hmm. to be able to gear up and, and 
you know, work 24 hours, you know, one day and then cut back. There are, there are so many rules and regulations about how an, a factory can operate in the United States. That's what's debilitated Apple's ability to manufacture things in the United States. Mm -hmm. It's not what they pay their employees here versus there. It's not a lot. So we've got to start ratcheting down on some of the rules and regulations right. that have made it a, a very difficult place to do business in the United States. And, and one of the things that Donald Trump pointed out this last week, the whole thing about the carrier, because one of the, the union guys, the, the, the local president, attacked him for lying about the numbers of jobs yeah. that were not going to yeah. go to Mexico. Right. And then Donald re retaliated by saying, hey, if it hadn't been for the union, you know, maybe they wouldn't have been looking to, to uh, move to uh, Mexico. Well, that's also going to, have to be uh, looked at very carefully. Yes. As you know, what is the rule, the uh, the role of unions, and, and what are they doing to the economy? Are they helping it or hurting it? Now, granted, I, I, I made the I made I learned long ago that you know if if you can get hired by a union, it's going to be in your best interest. Yeah. You know, for yeah. for a, for a long time. Yeah. But because um, uh, they generally make wages much better and working conditions yeah. better than they are yeah. for the non-union area, uh, but, um, but but you kind of get locked in. You know, uh, it, it's so good to be a member of a union that uh, you, you stay you know relatively particularly low paid in the in the union instead of trying to get up and and rise. And, well, anyway. Um, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, unions have had a very powerful, positive impact on our economy over the history of our, our country, but uh, there's been a lot of complaints that, that they've gone too far, and, and the, the, that Donald's attack on the union for, for influencing Carrier to send jobs south may have some validity. Goodness knows the automobile industry you know, used to be centered in Michigan, right. and the vast majority of cars now are, are built in, in right-to-work states like right. Tennessee and right. Texas. Right. And Toyota's right. actually invested right. in, in the southern United States right. in right. some right. of these places. But see, that's the benefit of Trump, Donald. He's worked with the unions before. Yes, he has. See, and he's, he's accomplished his goals uh, working with the unions before. So now when it gets down and getting back to the table with the union folks, that's basically, hey, guys, okay, fine. Let's continue this stuff because it is American, but let's make sure that it's fair enough that, one, I could make a profit, but better yet, let's make sure we build a structure. Because if I don't, quote, go to the bank and get the money, it doesn't get built, and guess what? You don't get to work. I say, yeah. I mean, if, if the business is overseas and they take their equipment there and their yeah. jobs there, yeah. then there's nothing for yeah. the union guys to yeah. do. Yeah, <laughs> it's all about eating, <laughs> right, Jim? Well, yes, it is. <laughs> but you know, it's usually. I mean, for instance, uh, there was a, a famous newspaper strike in New York many years ago, and the it was the unions didn't like the way you know they were, they felt they weren't getting paid enough, yeah. and as a result of that strike, several newspapers went broke. You know, and, and so the union guys lost their jobs because yeah. the, their employers went broke, and, and it had a tremendous negative impact yeah. on on the news industry in, in New York City, um, and that's never it's never been fixed. And you know, it, you know yeah. well, you see that all over now. You do, and that's 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 the beauty of getting a, a business person now. I mean, a true business successful person elected to office. Right. That's the beauty of this thing. And, and, and I, th I'm, I think we're really looking for some great things, I think, as far as America. And the other thing I was going to be making in regards to education, you think about the education person that he appointed, this, this, yes. this person. And uh, the bottom line is that on the other side of the corner is that we've educated the world. We have. All countries, all countries, all nations, if you will, around the world, if you will, have come to this country to get the education. Right. Now they're, they're, they're educated like anything else. They want to build jobs and be prosperous in their own respective areas. So it's so neat to have someone like Donald who's been there, who's been training, trained here, if you will, and been trained and basically been doing business all over the world aspect of it. Now he can sit down with all these folks and say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> well, this is where it's going to go. And you look at the Department of Education. That was brought to us by the Carter administration. Mm -hmm. yep. And if you look at its track record since then, Oh, you can almost see a graph. Okay, here's U.S. education since then by any mm. measurable objective except for spending. That's gone the other way, right? So you have, have this going on where spending goes up, the results go down, and you know you've heard the the howls from the left over uh, President-elect Trump's choice for education secretary. Here's the thing: it's somebody who is not beholden to the yeah, status quo, yeah, yeah. and that's where a lot of us who did end up supporting him look at that and say, well. This is why I supported him. Well, I want somebody who's going to do things differently. One more minute. Done right now. Break. Okay. And, and one of the things that uh, Ronald Reagan, one of his goals was to eliminate the education department, and he failed. 
And, and so that shows us the limitations of, of getting a new guy in that changing the, the status quo is very, very difficult. Uh, you know, I think Donald Trump has made some good steps in appointing or nominating good people to, to head agencies, but then the agencies are still populated with people who don't want to go and, and don't want to change. So the battle hasn't even begun yet. Oh, no, no, no. But I'm glad he's, I'm glad he's going to be sitting in that particular chair. That's going to be a good one. Now, unlike Reagan, you know, my point is that he was an actor, and he played True. in movies. You know what I'm saying? But he was a, but he was a guy. He, yeah. he was no, a no, I, I president. Know that, but, but, <laughs> but my point is that everybody recognized him as in the movie business aspect right. of it. This guy as is a in, spokesman for General this, Electric. That's that was right. a great this, gig for him. This guy's in a whole he different. Been this guy's in a whole different ball game aspect of it. Yeah. So anyway, look for the rest of you folks out here. Hey, look, read. You got to read. Catch up. I don't know if you can afford Comcast because if you want to go to CNN and, and Fox, that's the only way you're going to be able to get them, and that's a hundred bucks plus. Yeah, that's I'm never doing business with but them. But now again. you can you can Google something. Eventually, I think at some point in time on the smartphones, you're going to be able to get CNN and Fox. They're going to open mm -hmm. it up to the world, if you will. But the bottom line is that hey, you got to get involved. I'm glad you're joining us here at the Oregon Voters Digest, and uh, we're going to be probably coming back to talk about this subject once this person gets elected. He's a, he's a presumed elected person, but once he gets inaugurated, he gets two hats at the same time. He gets elected, and at the end of the ceremony, he's then the president of these United States. So fair. With that, okay, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to come back and talk about our own state. Let's make Oregon great. Be right back. You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Okay, folks, we're back. I'm Bruce Broussard, your host, and I've got my co-hosts right here. I've got uh, Jim, and you know them already, Jim and Jim and Scott here, and, and we're going to get into what makes Oregon great. We've got to make Oregon great. That's our focus. That's the brand today, and it doesn't cost you 100 bucks to get to see me. Well, no, yes, you do. I was going to say, yes, so whoever runs for no, governor no, no. next time, are they going to use that slogan, make Oregon great again? Make like Oregon it, great again. It's not very original, and, and, but maybe it works. <laughs> and you can get this show on, on, on YouTube, and you can get it on, yeah, you can get it on YouTube. There's them, Oregon Voters Digest. Google it. You got it right there. It doesn't cost you a hundred, hundred and a half. You can just get it right now. You can see us live. There we are right here. You'll see the whole show. So, okay, so like I said, uh, what we're going to do now, we're going to talk about Oregon. Well, Oregon, great, and more specifically for here in the Portland metropolitan area, we want to make Portland great again. City of Roses, we want to do that. So let's talk about Oregon. Now, Oregon is a is a balanced budget type state. We just, for some of you that don't understand that, it means that we, you know, you can only spend the money. <laughs> you can only spend the money if you balance the budget, right? With the with the what with the bills you're going out, the bills, and what you have to do this, that, and the other. At the end of the day, uh, it's not costing you anything. Then you come back to the table and do it all over again, right? Right. Okay. So we just went through that process, right? And we got someone here, Scott, who's out in Salem aspect of it. He's going to spend a little time and kind of give us a define a, again, go back and define this budget thing and what are some of the integral part aspect of it. And Jim's going to kind of uh, he went through and did, did a little research and kind of get hit maybe two hit two targeted areas that uh, that talked about maybe some of the concerns we have with the with this budget problem situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's yeah. go. Scott, you first. So the governor, Governor Kate Brown, released her recommended budget for the upcoming 2017-19 biennium. She held a press conference at the Capitol about it. I attended. And the rhetoric is already around budget shortfalls, which is disingenuous. Here's the thing. During the 
campaign for Measure 97, the proposed multi-billion dollar tax on business what sales as opposed yeah. to profits. Yeah, okay. um, one of our constituents called and said, hey, would you mind asking Legislative Revenue Office you know, how the revenues we have now compared to years past? So I did. I put in that call and Legislative Revenue Office was able to verify that at no point in the state of Oregon's history has it had more money than it has right now. Wow. Record revenues. Really? That was even before the latest figures came in from the Department of Revenue for the recreational marijuana sales, which have been beyond expectations. The fact of the matter is, this budget, despite being called the cuts budget, represents a 9% increase over the current budget that we have right now. We, the budget is an increase of $1.7 billion more than we had in wow. the biennium that we're in right now. Mm -hmm. So when you hear people talk about cuts and budget cuts. Who came up with that number? Was that the legislature? <laughs> No, that's just that's the uh, legislative revenue. One point seven billion dollars more than we've ever had. Mm -hmm. Really, a and we're still <laughs> talking about budget cuts. Jesus Christ! Well, now who, who made that decision not to to overlook that piece? Well, that would be the governor. That's and the this governor. is the same thing that we see every couple of years, where there's never enough money. And even if you had an infinite supply of money, it still wouldn't be enough. They were counting on that ballot measure to pass. So they would have billions of dollars more to spend on pet projects. So instead, what, what's going to happen is that during the legislative session, the Budget Writing Ways and Means Committee, they're going to do a road show. So they're going to travel around the country. And these different special interest groups that rely on state funding are going to orchestrate testimony among their members so that everywhere the legislative budget writers go, they're going to hear these stories, oh, all these programs and cuts, and we're going to be kicking people out on the streets. And they're going to be doing the same thing in the legislature. Every day of the legislative session, traditionally, is somebody else's lobby day. So hmm. you don't go a single day in that building without a group of people showing yeah. up, busing people in from all over the Capitol. It's almost like living in a sitcom in that regard. Now who's you the wait. translator for us, the public, the voting public, the people who got to be paying that bill? Oregon Citizens Lobby is about as close as you get. How about the media? The media's there, aren't they? Aren't they aren't, isn't that part of that job? Sure. Yeah, they, they, have, they have capital offices. Of course, they, uh -huh. those offices have been just as empty as everybody else's in the interim, oh, with Jesus. the exception of mine. Okay. <laughs> Since Jesus. I sit there by myself on the third Jesus floor of the Christ. Senate most days. But uh, there, there are other, other aspects of this that I wanted to hit upon. Now, the fact of the matter is, the general fund and lottery revenues are projected to grow by $1.3 billion over the next couple of years. Grow, so, meaning again, they, they're it, going to be getting more in. revenue. Right. Exactly. The uh, but the governor's recommended budget proposes to spend almost $3 billion more than ever before. So you've got that figure. We're already beyond where we were, but they're saying, oh, but, but we're still way mm -hmm. short of it. Fact of the matter is, according to the Taxpayers Association of Oregon Foundation, Oregon is the highest tax and spend state in the Western United States. And if you add up the amount of revenue that this state spends, like the state government, local governments, everybody, divided by the population is about $8,000 per resident. That's almost double what they spend in Utah, right? And it's more than California spends, it's more than Washington spends per resident, and it's more than 39 other states spend. Wow. We have a spending problem. Wow, wow, we do. wow. Who's signing off on it? They said the governor, right? But what about the legislature? Aren't they part and parcel of this process? They, We've got a legislative body. The Don't Democrats. they look at this stuff? Yeah, they, yeah they, they're pretty well controlled by the Democrats. Yes, so so who's, the, who's the leading proponent of that? You got, the, you got the chair in both of the parties. You got the Senate side. That's Courtney, right? No, Courtney's the Senate side, is it? He's, He's the Senate president. He's the Senate side. Who, who's, on, who's on the representative side? Well, the representative side, the, the longtime chair of the budget writing committee is State Representative Peter Buckley from Ashland, but he's done. So Wednesday is going to be his last day, along with my boss's last day, which makes me sad. <laughs> very, very, very sad. Now, who's the House chair? I mean, I, I hear Tina Kotek's name all the time. Every time I turn around, she's always she's the, the head She's the speaker. Of the, one of the co-chairs yeah, of Ways and Means is going to be State Rep. Nancy Nathanson from the Eugene area. From Eugene area. She's kind of taking okay, that over. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. So, so let, let's add some more goodies on that. So, okay, fine. Now, there was a recent bill that, that I voted for, that the Veterans Support Deal. I thought that was a very interesting piece. The most widespread, it was the most popular uh, initiative on the ballot was that uh, right. Measure 96. Yeah, everybody yes. voted for that. 83% of the vote. And I don't know who the these 17% are who voted against it. But, but then the thing that bothered me, I saw another article, and Jim jumped right on in this piece, but I, I saw another article that says, okay, fine, the governor says she's going to cut into this deal. She's, gonna, she's, not gonna, she, she's gonna take some of that money 
from several areas, but, but that particular one, the, the veteran piece, that's the one I want to focus on right off the bat, is that they're going to take some of that money to prop up the PERS. Well, and they got creative about it. So under that the provisions creative. of Measure 96, which was passed overwhelmingly by the people of this state, around $18.5 million in lottery funds are going to be added to the Department of Veterans Affairs budget. So you figure that would result in more services. Well, they did some budgetary gimmicks, and in the governor's recommended budget, they took almost $10 million from that agency and general fund dollars and, and swept it somewhere else. So this, to me... It helps point out why people re rejected Measure 97, the multi-billion dollar business tax increase. Because if you remember, during the campaign, they were saying, oh, this is going to go towards education, it's going to go to health services. Those of us in the building who know better were saying, look, this isn't a constitutional amendment. You can't bind future legislatures. The legislature can and will spend this money however they see fit. Politically, ideally, you know, they would spend it in the areas that they were supposed to. But then you see budgetary gimmicks like this and say, well, here's a clear example where the people said, fine, approve this amount of money for this program, and they're playing games with it, taking money out the back end. Yeah, that's, that's a real... The same thing would have happened with Measure 97. Pet projects would have been funded. Your services wouldn't have gotten any better. As opposed to spending time, if in fact there was a real need, if you will, spending the time with the business community and saying, hey, look here, uh, I mean, are, we, are you fairly paying your fair rent? You know what I mean? Just fairly mm -hmm. paying your fair rent. And if not, this is why we're doing this. This is where the money is going to go, because they're business folks. Right. And they would know but what that's remember, all about. What you, what you brought up during the election was the sad state of homeless veterans in yes. the Portland, Portland yes. metro area. Yeah. And and uh, there is another article in the paper. They're here. trying to claim now that they we have no more homeless veterans here in Portland. And that's ridiculous. They're well, out there right that's now. That's kind of what I thought. Yes, they are. And, and and you know the measure 96 wasn't specifically dedicated in the ballot initiative to uh, relieve homelessness. Right. Right. But you know support for veteran services could at least conceivably be used for that purpose and right. other things. Right. Um, so uh, again, the, the veterans who uh, you know they're, they're getting. They're getting stabbed in the back again. No, it's a ripoff. <laughs> well, it's it, a ripoff by the state. What was really interesting you know, by, by was that earlier this week they had a business leadership summit just about within walking distance of here at the convention center. And I went to the same thing a couple of years ago, and it was a legislative preview. So you had a lot of the le legislative leadership there. And, you know, here's the governor saying, okay, guys, let's, let's all get together. Here's the thing Kitzhaber, when he was governor, managed to bridge that divide between business and labor in this state mm -hmm. and keep a, a really expensive ballot measure like 97 off of the ballot in 2014. Mm -hmm. it, there was probably some self-serving reasons for that too because he was up for re-election uh, so, so he could get really cynical. But what was great about this business leadership summit was that the business community pushed back. The business community said, well, you guys aren't doing anything to address the spending side of things mm -hmm. and you need to reform PERS. The fa and that is the elephant in the room, is this state's public employee's retirement system, its unfunded liabilities, and its impacts on local government services. Because that gets felt every school district, every city, every state. Oh, some of them, about a quarter of their budget, doesn't go to, towards providing services to anybody under their jurisdiction, but it goes towards the state's PERS system. Wow. Well, you know... <laughs> That, that is interesting. I, I've done, we've done a lot of things here on Oregon Voters Digest in regards to PERS some time ago. had another gentleman. His name doesn't come to mind right off the bat, but the one thing I did learn about this whole piece was the fact that, uh, th th you know, government is not about uh, a rich person type retirement. It's a blue collar kind of a retire retirement kind of a deal. It's not, quote, you're not supposed to be basically going to government to get to be rich. If you want to get rich, you go out, take your chances, just like anybody else. Well, Open nobody should be able to make more in retirement than they were to work for yeah, a living. I mean, and it, and it I just understand blows that. Your mind. The idea is that once you retire, your kids have left the house, your car is paid off, your house is paid off, and you can live off of absence of expense. Which is not to say that we, you know, between Social Security and some retirement, you, know, you have a safety net. Um, but that being said, that doesn't do you any good if the entire system itself is insolvent and we're quickly heading there. Well, and what about oh, and, and, and it, I, I, I'm a little bit familiar with uh, Josephine County down south. Yeah. Uh, they have not had an active uh, county law enforcement presence for quite some time because there hasn't been enough money 
uh, to to pay for sheriff's deputies to do anything other than uh, take care of the jail. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and even that, they're only going to be able to do for so long. Right. And and mm -hmm. so, uh, be, and, and part of the problem, it's, it's not the whole thing, there's also a lack of political will. There are a lot of outlaws in Josephine County who don't want an active law enforcement presence so they can grow marijuana. Uh, so, but but one of the, the problems is that if you if you hire somebody, you, you pay them, uh, let's say eighty thousand dollars in salary. When you look at the entire benefits package, it's more like um, one hundred and twenty. Uh, and you know how much it costs to put a, a, a police car on the on the street? It's like uh, you know the, the car is maybe worth uh, forty thousand before it's tricked out. By the time you tricked it out with the computer and everything else, we're looking at one hundred thousand dollars per Gee. police car on the road. So uh, the costs of law enforcement are really, really high. And as I say, in Josephine County, the people have said, no, we don't want to spend it. Um, and, and there have been some real problems. You know, there are some vulnerable people are being victimized because there is no law enforcement to, to protect them. Gee, um, but then you know, other communities in the state are, uh, you know, perhaps overly yeah. <laughs> funding yeah. law enforcement. Yeah. 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 Well, you don't think on that same particular note, going right back to this, this whole issue of the PERS aspect of it, you know, in that per system aspect of it, it was said some time ago that here is a Oregon coach picking up over a half a million dollars a year, a little over a half a million dollars a year for the rest of his life. Right. He was just a coach. 10 and or he 12 can still years, work. Too. 10 or 12 years. 10 or 12 years. You know, and but there were a number of folks who were making over two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars. Many people, over four thousand people were making those kinds of dollars aspect of it. And some of the names were very, very familiar. But the fact of the matter is, you're going to take some of this money. This, here, here's the governor of this state saying, well, we want to make sure that these people keep getting a raise. They still keep a, get, they get a raise on, a, on an ongoing basis. Well, our, our, our disgraced former governor, Kulangowski, yeah. I'm sure he's pulling down a purse oh, yeah, deal yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's one of the interesting things is, gee, when is he going to get brought to court? <laughs> That, that's an investigation that's gone on for a very, very almost you know two years now, Gee. essentially. Oh, for Kitsaber? Yes, and his girlfriend. And if you want to get angry about this whole piece, I mean, I, I, Google it. <laughs> just get Oregon, Oregon Purge. Oh, you do just with Oregon Purge, and it comes on. They even list the names of the people and how much they're getting. It'll blow your mind. You even have some folks here locally. I mean, it was, I think Lars Larson made the point about, uh, and, you know, I mean, I'm, a, I'm just being very specific people that I know. Margaret Carter, she's making over eighty thousand dollars, about a hundred thousand dollars a year, rest well, of her life. It, it, she was just a legislator. Run for office. <laughs> Here's one of the other deals, though. If you have a vibrant, thriving private sector, where you have investment, where you have diverse industries, and you have people in the private sector making those kinds of salaries and above, then it's a whole lot easier to fund more, all yeah, of this, yeah, right? Yeah, but yeah, if, if yeah, it's yeah, the opposite, yeah, where you have yeah. people on PERS getting paid more to retire than the people who are working to fund their salaries, yeah. your system is upside down. Yeah, yeah. That, that's well, just it thing, at the end yeah, of the day. The other thing is you look at even salaries for government employees. You know, in, in, a, in a normal world, the, the people in, the, in private industry are, are going to be paid more than people in, in working for the government. But that really hasn't been the way it works in, in most of Oregon mm -hmm. now. Uh, most of the, the Oregon uh, government employees are, are making more than their, their neighbors or friends and neighbors who right. are in private industry. Right, right, right. right. Uh, our, you know, the private industry salaries have pretty much flatlined for quite some time, mm -hmm. whereas government employee benefits have gone up and up and up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, to be a government employee now is, is, a, is a really good deal. And, you know, is that a, is that proper? Is that appropriate? Or should they well, that's actually... The best, that's, the best, that's the best job in town, as long as you got an employer... <laughs> Willing to open up shop. Well, and <laughs> when I was with, with the House Caucus, I put together district profiles, and that included largest employers. And for a lot of these rural areas, your largest employers are government agencies. It's yes, local yes, school yes, district. Yes. It's the U.S. Forest Service office there in town. where do they get their money? Town. Where do they get their money? Uh, well, it, he talked about Josephine County earlier. I, I lived there for years. No, but where do, so you, I get, went to, where do you get the money? Uh, I'm getting there. employers. I, I'm getting there, right? So uh, well, in Josephine County... Yeah, grants pass, I lived there, went to high school there, but ended up reporting there for years. Now, we got there in 94, my family, I was a teenager at the time, and that was when the timber industry was starting to decline. It was essentially replaced with the retirement industry, which is fine, except 
you have the demographics now in that community where you have senior citizens on fixed incomes. Mm -hmm. They're drawn to that area because of the low property taxes. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in quadrupling their property taxes. Mm -hmm. They're not. They've been mm -hmm. given ample opportunity to do so every two years mm -hmm. for the last several years. Mm -hmm. And then all the young people from Josephine County, guess what? They're all in Washington yeah. County, yeah. right? I mean, it seems like every day I find another former classmate of mine who lives in Tigard or Wilsonville or Beaverton, somewhere up here, because there was nothing for them to do down south. Anybody left down in Southern Oregon, a lot of them are struggling. They're on government assistance instead of mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. the, in these industries and creating a tax base. So, you know, people on this side of the state tend to look down on them and say, oh, gee, well, why don't you want to pay for your government? You say, well, it's against the law to conduct industry and commerce on most of the land within mm -hmm. the county, mm -hmm. uh, over half of which is owned by the federal government that won't do anything with it or won't let anybody else do anything with it. It's a matter of demographics. Hmm. So. Well, That's we must it. be making some pretty good money here in the Portland area. It looked like Steve Novak just, he made national news. He just said, hey, are you going to put a tax on uh, on all these uh, CEOs, if you will? And I guess it's going to generate something like, what, 10, 20, 30 million bucks or something it like that? It won't generate a dime because it won't pass. <laughs> okay. I hope. I mean. No, no, no. They, they, they passed it through city council. They by ordinance. They already passed it. They already passed it. They got the three votes. And so Done. if you're thinking about national news. if you're thinking about bringing a company to Portland, if you're thinking about <laughs> investing in this community, yep. bringing your business with oh, you. Oh, that's the one if they, they get paid more than was it 100 percent? Yeah, 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 of, yeah, 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 yeah. Of the employees. Yeah, that was just a CEO or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he just did that. National news. Well, I mean, but then it was the same individuals that were supporting his campaign, but they evidently didn't give him enough money because he lost. <laughs> yes, he did. See, so he got irritated and said, boom, I'm going to do this piece. Well, he was in search of some kind of a legacy. Uh, the and proposed it, it, road it, tax that he yeah. and Charlie Hales He's spent all their political capital on didn't get them there because yeah. they didn't do it right. It's a good point because in all due respect, uh, uh, Charlie was the one that voted for her. He was, I think he was one of the, I think, uh, uh, who was the other, other two people that voted for that piece? Well, Novak voted one. Mm -hmm. And what's the what's the woman that's there? Uh, what was it? Oh, Amanda Fritz. Amanda Fritz. Mm -hmm. Those were the three votes. The other two guys said no, <laughs> which is interesting. Well, Salts Saltzman's going to be up for re-election next time around. Yeah, I mean, he's so a million-dollar baby, too, by the way. I mean, he's made his money. In fact, he shouldn't be running right uh, now. I was going to say, I mean, I scanned his statement of economic interest back in 2011 <laughs> hey. for a database. It's like the size of a phone book. You can't yes. hit anything in downtown Portland. You can throw a rock in any direction and hit something he owns a piece that's of. That's right. See, yeah. so, so he, he wants to run. Folks, remember now, like I said, it, and, you know, in all, Dan, in all due respect, you need to give it up. You just really need to just give it up, buddy. Trust me. And then take your buddy Fish with you, too. I mean, he's got that Arts Commission thing. I mean, people are still we're still complaining about that whole business, about what are we getting for it. We're not getting anything. And the one thing I can recall is a piece of art, you know, when I was running for mayor, mayor yes. of the city of Portland, in northeast Portland, a very memorable kind of a portrait that the city owns aspect of it that has been vandalized and this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and many artists were participants in that piece, and we couldn't get a penny to get them to go in and, and clean that situation up. How That's much right. could that possibly have Fish, cost? A bucket of paint? And Mr. Fish <laughs> is sitting up there. He basically chairs this whole issue with the arts money. Remember that art tax that you that you have to pay, that we still have to pay, that we're trying to figure out where's the money going? Well, I'll tell you what. Google the Arts Commission. <laughs> Google the Arts Commission. Find out who's on the board and who's getting the money. You'll find some very familiar names that are sitting on the board and getting money under the table. Well, similarly, the, under Get the, it done. the guise of this CEO tax is that, okay, you're going to send this money to the city, and the city is going to spend it to combat inequality. Yes. Well, what the hell yeah, does that mean? What, what, that means that? we're going to hire more people to work for the city to go get in business of private businesses. Uh, but it, is this what, actually going to result what, what, in inequality? Any, it, we don't have inequality. We do that here. <laughs> Well, We're very diverse right on this panel right here. Look, and this is probably very unpopular <laughs> to say, but at the end of the day, especially if you're an international company, your competition for high-level executives like CEOs, yes. it, it, there's that whole discussion of should there be a maximum wage. It says, well, maybe in the, in the public sector there should be, right? To so cap some of these salaries of people, but ultimately, unless you're a shareholder, what the CEO of this company makes is kind of between the company and, and that individual yeah, and but, their customers and their shareholders. But even in the... In the in Not the, the city uh, of Portland. Geez. But even in the government area, we just had a, uh, we just fired our, our head football coach for the University of Oregon yep, and yep. hired a new guy. Yep. And I guarantee you that guy is going to be making a lot of money, the new, the new coach. Sure. And, and, and you know, typically, I, I, would, I would expect he's going to be the highest paid government employee in the state. Yeah. Uh, yep, yep, and yep, and yep. that's just wrong. And see, I made the joke about the last coach. Yeah, there was who, just this five, right? What was the record? Four and eight? I said, 
we're going to be paying PERS benefits for this guy? Really? There's nothing the in this rest, contract the, that says if the Beavers beat you, you don't get PERS. If the Huskies beat you, you don't get PERS. Right. If you, no, I think they should get PERS if they bring glory to the program. Here's well, a national Caleb, championship. Caleb. Here's a bowl game. You know Here's a winning record. You no, know I, I can't buy yeah, None of those. I, I can't afford the tickets to go to the game. So look, right. look just yeah. separate the tax from me. See? You know I mean? <laughs> if I don't have to pay the taxes, fine. You can deal with it. <laughs> or we could just say it was the division of Nike, and then we, we could just cut out the the, the, the the farce that it's University of Oregon, just call it, you know, Nike, uh, Nike, Nike football. University. Oh, wow, wow, gee whiz. <laughs> well, folks, as you can see, we're about, about two minutes out. You can see we got a problem, but I think we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna have to do something about making Oregon great, right? Well, as I said, th there great. was one other story about Oregon. Real quick, right? we got about two minutes. Talking about Real Nike, quick. because apparently there's, there's a, a measure being discussed at the U.S. Congress okay. about uh, reducing corporate taxes for everybody, but increasing uh, the cost of, of uh, doing the manufacturing outside the United States and then and sending the, the goods to the United States. Um, that has a tremendous potential negative impact on Nike and Apple Computer and a lot of other the big companies, big companies. that do all their or almost all their manufacturing outside the United States. Um, Maybe it brings some of them back. Maybe you throw in some regulatory certainty and say, okay, compliments of the Donald Trump era. Well, that's where it's coming from. Let's see some insourcing for the from. first Donald time in Trump. decades. So boy, because you. if you remember, during the Clinton administration, they started using that phrase post-industrial yes, economy. They yes, thought we were yes. all going to be working at startups, yes. and then that bubble burst. The fact of the matter is, you still need to make things. You still need a vibrant, thriving manufacturing sector. Well, or, and or the you. folks in the Midwest agreed, and that's why they voted for Trump after voting Democrat the last several cycles. Phil right. Knight is a good guy with the Knight guy. Mm -hmm. Aspect of it. In fact, in fact what I'm, I'm even sharing. Phil, I know you're a philanthropist and aspect of it. Please run for governor next time around. <laughs> we, we need a businessman in Oregon. I'm just throwing it out to you because he understands the bottom line. You know, my point is that so then maybe if he could focus on Oregon, just focus on Oregon and the issues that we have from education, law enforcement, the whole nine yards, because that's, the, that's basically how he made his monies. He, he, he has a very successful company, and Phil, you're the, you're the guy. You can just spend, just spend four years, four years, please. And then two years around, what about another two years? We're yes. right back. Two years, right. two years. So please, we need someone like you. We need, excuse me, we need another Trump. We need a Trump for Oregon. I mean, they all look alike to me, as far as I'm concerned, as long as you're successful. I, I've, not, successful. I've not and heard anybody you announcing. Like that Have you heard that one? I'm announcing it right now. I'm appointing. I'll, I'll appoint him. I'm a, I'm a citizen of this state. We're going to appoint him. Can we appoint him? Can I get a yay or nay? He didn't Any say problems? yes, but but that's a, that's an interesting. You know, it would be it would be earth shattering if we had a really successful businessman, and there aren't that many in Oregon, uh, to to run for governor. I think that's an outstanding idea. I'd love to see more business people run for the legislature. That's these why discussions I, that's would why I have go these two guys. Drastically different if we had more people with business experience. Sounds in that great. Building. On that particular note, we're going to close. Hey, thanks very much. Look. Have good holidays. We're gonna have one more show before we close for a while, okay? So stick around. This next time around is gonna be a good one. We're gonna be talking about education. It's gonna be a fine one and some other goodies. Jim, Rick, Scott, thanks guys. Have a good one, folks. Enjoy yourself. Don't eat too much.